this evening. Good. Awesome, awesome. I just want to get up here and say that I'm Coach Douglas, um, took over the baseball program about a month ago, and I appreciate you guys being out here tonight to support our program. Um, this wouldn't be possible without you guys, without you guys coming out to give us this opportunity. Um, I want to thank the parents, the players, the moms and dads and community members that have donated their time, their products, their efforts to make this happen. Um, we want to return that investment for you. So what this is going to allow us to do for our program is almost immeasurable. So I just wanted to take this chance to say thank you guys for being here. Thank you for supporting us. And I can't wait to see you guys in our field this season. So enjoy the rest of your evening. You feel free. Um, if you got a minute, come by, shake my hand, introduce yourself. And hopefully we can give you guys a baseball program you can be proud of moving forward. So thank you guys. Douglas said, thank everybody for coming out here tonight. I'm Coach Cope, girls high school basketball coach. Uh, privilege enough to MC for the uh, hit king tonight, Mr. Pete Rose. 17-time All-Star, uh, three-time World Series champion, 4,256 hits. And when I say 17-time All-Star, that was at five different positions. Uh, we're going to bring Mr. Rose up here in just a few minutes, but like Coach Douglas said, this says so much. This speaks volumes about the town of Manchester. Uh, you guys said a few months ago Pete Rose was coming. You got a thousand people here tonight. That's unbelievable. Everybody give yourself a round of applause for showing up tonight. When my basketball girls take the court, if they play with one tenth of the effort that Mr. Rose played with, we're probably going to win that night. That's something that's been lost through the years. The hustle, uh, the determination, the grit, we don't see that today. It's, it's kind of a lost generation. And I try to instill that into all my girls with, like I said, one-tenth of the effort he plays with. We're probably going to win that night. Right now we have uh, our mayor going to come up, Miss Marilyn Howard. We, I know we've already ate, but Jeff wants to go ahead and do a blessing. So we're going to bring Dr. Joey Vaughn up to do the uh, do the blessing of our ceremonies tonight. Joey, we kind of cutting out here, so just hold it up. <laughs> all right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to also welcome you. And uh, the man walking back here in the back, Jeff Lowe, uh, he'll get me for this, and that's what you get for bringing me up here. But Jeff, work here is really here. You the We will, um, we're not, we've already had food, but we are going to uh, bless this community. If you'll pray with me, remove your hands, please. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come to you this time. Thank you, Father, for the day that we've been given. Thank you, Father, for the many opportunities that you've blessed us with in this life. We know that we are richly blessed. We pray that you will continue to be with us, that you'll be with those that lead this nation, that they'll make good decisions that are in accordance to your will. We pray that you will continue to watch over the young men that are represented here tonight that you will uh, keep them safe, uh, that they will learn much uh, as they go about their season, that things will go well for them, and that you will also bless each of us in our daily walks of life. Again, Father, we thank you. We pray that you'll be those who are sick. We know that there are many, that they will be uh, out of reasonable amount of help once again soon. Now, Father, as we continue to go through this night, we pray you go with us, that you will guide, guard, and direct us for all walks of life. If any of them found a faithful home, that is our prayer. Christ name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Joe. Thank you guys for uh, turning.
turn out and a thousand people wow. And uh, when Jeff asked me to uh, introduce Pete Rose, it's like, wow. I had told him earlier, I said, you know Pete Rose? And he said, yes, I know Pete Rose, but Marilyn Howard, you know Pete Rose? Because he knows I'm not really a big sports fan. But, but um, yes, I went to UT ball games and, but, you know, I didn't like the orange. I really rather had the red at Alabama, but it was fun to go to the game. But um, when I was asked to, um, to introduce you, Pete, it was like, when I was a uh, young girl, Growing up, we had uh, six brothers and one sister. And my brothers would beg us every Sunday to, my sister and I, to play, to play ball. And I'd always say, we'd say no. And so they would always say, you know, we'll give you a nickel to play. Well, my sister couldn't be bought. But guess what? I did. <laughs> so I knew that, um, that if I, if I had to, I always had to catch the ball or I would lose my job every Sunday. So I watched Pete Rose. I watched how he called him high, he called him low. So I, they always put me on first base. And I knew if I, for that nickel, if I didn't catch those balls, no matter how hard it stung in my hand, that I would lose my job. And so Pete, you gave me my first paying job by watching me. <laughs> and you know, I grew up on a farm, and we didn't, and I didn't have first base catcher's glove. It was thin, and no matter how hard it stung, I watched how you caught that ball. And that was a lesson I learned in life that if I if I was paid to do a job, no matter how hard, if it was my mistake or life's mistake, I stayed in the game. And you taught me that, Pete. And I'm sure I could look. And look around the room, and everybody in this room's got a story about Pete Rose. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, but it is, I love to these young men and ladies too. And by the way, I never knew how to bat like you. I did. I, I was on teacher's leave, and they were amazed that I could hit the ball, but maybe I did learn something watching you. <laughs> but anyway, watching these young men that's wa walking around the room. And and their the game of baseball is still out there, thanks to you, Pete, and, and so many more. And you may not, you guys and ladies who play play the ball, you might not end up being a Pete Rose. But I can tell you, no matter how hard that 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 ball hit my glove, I knew I signed up for it. And if I was going to stay in the game, and you'll learn the same thing, same thing too that you will take that hit and you will watch the people who do it well. You will you will learn from your mistakes and I and I thank you, Pete Rose. And it's my pleasure to introduce the greatest ambassador to uh, baseball is Pete Rose. And I thank you and God bless you.
Don't be overly excited. And, the hell will they do? Yeah, because what are you going to do? Suspend me? <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky enough to play in 17 All Star games. Like he said, in five different positions. And by the way, you're not asking me my favorite position, are you? I listened to Lucky on the radio the other day. I will not ask you that. Yeah. Well, everybody in this room has a favorite position, and I'm the only one who's going to say first base. <laughs> Is it Tom Bitch, huh? <laughs> anyway, Jeff, sit down. You make me nervous, man. <laughs> His ass off, but he made coffee nervous. <laughs> anyway, the only, the only All-Star game in the 17 that I lost was the 16th game in uh, Detroit when Reggie Jackson hit that ball off of Doc Ellison. We were out to dinner the night before <clears throat> just talking and Willie Mays at the next table. He's my teammate. And we talked and we talked and he said, I'll be right back. i got to go to the restaurant. And when Willie came back, <clears throat> he looked like Willie Mays should look. Alligator shoes. Light gray suit, white shirt, purple tie. But when he came back, he had water all over both sides of his knees. And I'm looking and said, Willie, what the hell's going on? I can talk just like Willie. He said, man, you ain't going to believe this. He said, I was in there taking a pee. And the guy said, ain't you one of me? <laughs> Someone in this world is peeing on Willie Man. <laughs> now, you ready for your part of the program, Coach? And I'm ready. Uh, Feats, you were obviously a member of the Big Red Machine, 75 76 World Series champions. Uh, to me, the greatest team ever assembled. Uh, tell us a little bit about that team, those years in Cincinnati, and who you were the closest to on that team. <laughs> Well, I would never get in front of a group uh, and say that we were the best team ever because I don't know how the 27 Yankees was with Ruth and Garrick and all those guys or some of the Dodger teams. But I will tell you one thing, that we were the most entertaining team ever. We had home run leaders, RBI leaders, batting champions, Golden Glove catcher, Golden Glove second base, Golden Glove shortstop, Golden Glove center field. We had white stars, we had black stars, and we had Latino stars. And we had all of fame managers, Sparky Anderson. So we had a lot of fun going to the ballpark every day uh, because we won more games than anybody. You know, when I think of the 28 major league records that I have, it's pretty good for a white guy, isn't it? <laughs> Why are you laughing so hard over there? You know, uh, I was lucky enough to play the best record I got is I played in 1972 winning games. That's when I participated in the game. We won almost 2,000 games. And uh, that's really a credit to the teammates I had. You know, I played with the greatest catcher ever. I played with the greatest third baseman ever. I played with the greatest second baseman ever. And I played with the only Cuban to make the Hall of Fame, Tony Perez. That's the kind of company that I hung around with. Early in my career, I played with Frank Robinson, one of the top five players ever. And I played with Andre Dawson. I played with Tim Raines. I played with Barry Larkin. What did they all have in common? They're all Hall of Famers. So that's the kind of people that, that I like to hang around with. Guys who think about winning and guys who care about winning. That's what I was telling the young team today. The only reason you play is to win. You don't play for exercise. I don't think you do. You play tennis for exercise. <laughs> Go ahead. 1978, you had a 44 game hit streak. Second longest of all time. Uh, kind of take us through that and tell us if there was more pressure during that 44 game hit streak or trying to get 4192 or was there any pressure on, on either one of them? No, there's a 44-game hit streak. 
uh, if you want to call it pressure, you had to get hit every night. But that's what I was paid to do. I was paid to get hits to score runs. I just had to do it in, in almost two months in a row. And it was fun because uh, I get them all depressed. And I know, I know one guy was rooting for me to, to extend that streak. His name was Ted Turner. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you why. Because the night that the streak ended, they, he had 26,000 people walk up to the game. Because in those days, the Atlanta Braves uh, were drawing about five or 6,000 a night. And all of a sudden, Ted got, you know, 34,000. So he was rooting for the next night. He was pissed off at the pitcher who got me out. <laughs> Cost him money. Now, 4192, uh, that was no pressure because I had a whole month to get one hit. You know what I mean? So pressure is when you make three hits and you have one game left. That would be pressure. But uh, I, I thrived on pressure. You know, I, I had fun with the pressure. Uh, playing in a World Series is pressure. You know, so, but you never get tired of playing any. I only got, I only got to play in six. Uh, and I played 24 years, so I got to go to the World Series once every six years, which isn't bad. I think four times six is 24, isn't it? I don't know about that in Tennessee, but I know in Vegas it is. <laughs> 44 games ago, everybody says 56, and DiMaggio is one of the unbreakable records. Uh, uh, early in your career, in, in the 60s, you were able to go to Vietnam and, and get to hang out with Joe DiMaggio. You got any stories from that trip? Well, yeah, I got one that's pretty funny, but it might get me kicked out of Tennessee. Uh, I get a call in 1967, that's the true story, and I hope I don't offend anybody. And if I did, get your ass out of here. Right? I get a call from the State Department, a guy identifies himself. And he said, would you like to go to Vietnam? And I said, well, not necessarily. There's a war going on. <laughs> he said, well, Joe DiMaggio's for him. And I said, I get to meet Joe? He said, you get to live with him for 23 days. I said, sign me up. So I flew to San Francisco, got on a world airliner. Joe and I and Canigliero and a guy named Jerry Coleman went to Saigon. They broke us up into two groups. Joe and I went south. They went north. We ended up meeting them on the Intrepid, which is an aircraft carrier in Stockton, New York. <clears throat> and if you don't know Vietnam, it's, it's so damn hot you can't sleep. And it's a jungle. And all you can hear is boom, 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 mortars going off. We're on, up on this hill, a valley, a hill. And Joe says, man, I gotta take a shower. I said, Joe, we're not downtown Saigon. We're in the middle of the damn jungle. He said, I don't give a shit. I slept with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> We'll see if we can get you a shower. <laughs> so somebody had to get up, which was me, okay, and pour water into this canvas thing and pull the chain. And the guy underneath took a shower. I gave Joe DiMaggio a shower. <laughs> now, <laughs> the best way to scrub Joe, Joe DiMaggio is he was a penis with a man hanging from it. <laughs> I don't know how that son of a bitch hit 56 in a row carrying that junk around. From that day on, I envied Marilyn Monroe. What are you laughing about? We're going to stay away from Joe. He was the nicest guy in the world with a soldier. Uh, how do you follow that? <laughs> uh, late 70s, uh, you left Cincinnati, became a free agent, uh, ended up going to the Phillies, and at that time became the highest play payer in, in all of sports. Uh, and that wasn't even the highest offer on the table. You decided to go to Philadelphia. What made you decide to go to Philadelphia? Because I know a bunch of teams were after you. Well, I figured this way. In, in the 70s, Philly was a good team, but they had problems with the Reds. 
So if I need the reds to go to Philly, they don't have a problem with the reds no more. <laughs> and I like Wazinski, I like Boa, I like Schmidt. You know, I hung around with those guys when they came in to play us in Cincinnati. Uh, I could have went to Ted Turner when he gave me a million dollars a year for four years. Then he come back and said, I'll give you the four million, but I'll give you 100000 a year after you retire every year until you die. Now, knowing that son of a bitch, he'd have me assassinated a year after I died. <laughs> then, the guy, in, the guy in, in Pittsburgh owned racehorses. And you guys know I like racehorses. <laughs> and I can tell you one thing, okay, this is the truth. If he'd have offered me a Kentucky Derby winner with balls that big, I'd have been a Pittsburgh pilot. <laughs> And the guy in Kansas City, he offered me oil wells. But the best offer I got, I think, I negotiated with Aki Bush, who was in a hospital for a hernia operation, and he offered me a Budweiser distributorship. But I didn't want to go to re replace Lou Brock. I wanted to go to Philadelphia. And it worked out okay for me because we, I was there five years and we went to two World Series. And we won one. And when we won the World Series, it was the first time in 86 years that the Phillies won, which is a long time, which is a long time. So it worked out okay for me. And I came back and I went to Montreal, had to go up there and speak French for four months. Probably two months say my ass. <laughs> then I went back to Cincinnati as a player manager. And <clears throat> when I went back to Cincinnati in August of 84, I really deserved the opportunity to play the next year. Now don't forget, I'm 44, 45 years old. But from the time I got back to the last seven weeks of the season, I hit 365, which is a pretty good average. And I played every day. So I kind of earned the opportunity to play in 1985. If I had hit 175, I wouldn't have been able to take a roster spot. So I kind of earned that opportunity. And I took advantage of it. Anytime you get an opportunity, you got to take advantage of it. You know, in 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, uh, I worked for Marge Schott. You, know, you all know who Marge Schott is? When I worked for Marge, she was the only member of the organization that had facial hair. <laughs> Talking about horse racing, you're a horse racing guy. We know that. Who would be your all time trifecta? Um, I think, you know, it's not a trifecta. Well, secretary up, up there. You know, there's so many good horses, so many good jockeys. And I've been on so many bad horses, so many bad jockeys. You know, I, I've been on a duck one time and somebody's drowned. <laughs> Now, I grew up, Jeff, will you sit down? You make me nervous. That boy's trying to raise money for this operation here, I'm telling you. Anyway, I'm a, I'm a young kid. And if, if you never heard of Don Zimmer, he was one of the best baseball people that there ever was. They called him Popeye. And we grew up in the same neighborhood. He was a little older. Our dads were teammates. And his dad was the biggest gambler in the world, but the nicest guy. And I'm 10, 11 years old. He said, one day he said to me, you know, Pete, I had a dream last night about white hats and black hats and round hats and square hats. And I went to work and a guy gave me a new Cincinnati red hat. And as he did every day, he ate lunch, he went 10 miles east to River Downs Racetrack and opened up the program. And number one was top hat. Now, if you know anything about gambling, you're dreaming about hats, if I gave you a new hat, he bet $1,000 to win on Top Hat in 1950, which is a big, big bet, okay? And they're, go they're going to turns that are out of the gates and coming down, they're coming to the home stretch. The last jump, a 50 to one shot beat Top Hat. And Doug was the same. I said, Doug, who won the race? He said, Sombrero. <laughs> So 
if he'd have been Spanish, he'd have won fifty thousand dollars. That's a hard look, son of a book, right there. Wow. Hey, we got two uh, auction items tonight that we're going to auction off during this. Uh, one of them Jeff just brought up, and he said it's the only known money in the world to exist from a Herbie Nugent ticket sale. So we got a Herbie Nugent $100 bill here. Would anybody like to bid on that? Do we have any bid? I'll bid $200. Pete Rose, $200 on it. Anybody else? Jeff bids $500. We got $500 for a Herbie Nugent $100 bill sign. Got $500 in the back. B.B. Brown in here, is he? I'm not, I'm not an auctioneer, but we'll get this thing going here. Got 500 in the back. 500 Jeff Lowe. 500 Jeff Lowe. Anybody else want in on this Herbie Nugent $100 bill? Well, maybe I'll tell him who the hell Herbie is. Yes. <laughs> Jeff, you got any Herbie Nugent stories? Well, that was a failure. Jeff Lowe, $500 right here. And those are cool socks, man. Thanks, sir. Thank Did you. Did you buy them new? I got them in my uh, stocking last year. Wife got them for me. Wow. Yeah. 51 years old. I'm going to be coaching. I'm about 70, Pete. I got a seven-month-year-old son right there, so. Wow, it still works, huh? That's right. <laughs> Most street smart guy I've ever met in my life. What Sparky Anderson did, which you need to do as a coach or a manager, uh, is you have to understand your people. Everybody is different. Everybody has something that they can do. And you gotta get them to do that on a daily basis. He didn't treat me like he did Johnny. He didn't treat Johnny like he did Joe. He didn't treat Joe like he did Tony. You know, so. But he was the best. He was the best at treating people. And he, he always told me, think about this. And I think it's true. There's three ways you can treat a person. Pat him on the butt, kick him in the butt, or leave him alone. How else can you treat a person? You don't kick the guy and he's patted. You don't pat the guy and he's kicked. And it's up to you as the boss. You're the one that knows how, what makes the guy tick. And Sparky was the best at that. That's why we had one set of rules, okay? Everybody, same set of rules. No special things to anybody. All the spring training, you know, Sparky uh, would leave me, on, leave me off on a Saturday if the basketball tournament was on. Because he knew I wouldn't have been on the Sunday. But <laughs> he would let Johnny uh, and Joe, they let them off a Saturday to go play golf. He let Tony, he'd get off on a Saturday to go fishing. Who the hell's going to go to spring training to go fishing? That was Tony Perez. I met Tony Perez. I've been knowing Tony Perez. Think about this, anybody. You, you, you know anybody for 61 years? That's how long I've known Tony Perez. When I signed a baseball contract two days out of high school, and I went to Geneva, New York, to play for the Geneva Reds, there was a second baseman on the team at the time named Antonacio Perez. That was Tony Perez. Okay? He was the second baseman. I moved him to third and put me at second. I went to lunch with him about three weeks ago in Cincinnati. And I sat there for three hours and didn't understand a word he said. <laughs> he still can't speak English. <laughs> but listen, this is kind of a bad story, but it's, it's the truth. Hey, kid, shut up a little bit. <laughs> it's your turn, buddy. Wait 70 years. We're, we're playing Riverfront Stadium. This is a true story. And Tony goes in, and he's got to use the bathroom. And I swear to God, ladies and gentlemen, he took a dump, and the turd was that long. <laughs> not this long, not that long. This on a clubhouse guy, Bernie Stowe, put a sign up on the commode, please don't flush world's longest turn. <laughs> it was in there three days. We had other commodes. Now, hopefully we're all going to go to the bathroom tomorrow. Okay? That's, that's the way it's supposed to go. 
Can you imagine Tony Perez sitting there like this and doing a turn that <laughs> How still did he have to be? If <laughs> like that, don't break that son of a bitch off, baby. <laughs> think about that. When you go to the bathroom tomorrow, you're all going to think about Tony Perez. <laughs> God bless Tony. Well, number two on the list is Tony Perez. And <laughs> Johnny Bench. Johnny Bench. Greatest pitcher ever. Um, he come up in 68. I was rookie year in 63. Helms was rookie year in 66. Uh, Johnny come up in 68, was rookie of the year. And uh, he, he was a one-handed catcher, if you know what I mean. Most catchers catch with two hands, but he has such big hands, he can catch with one hand. And uh, he really becomes the best catcher, maybe ever. I don't know who would be a better catcher than Johnny Bench. And I got to play with him a long time. The only problem with Johnny is he, he couldn't run. He was a slow poop. If he's on first, you had to hit a home run to score that Sunday. <laughs> He used to have an old, old saying it's in baseball, you know, don't carry that piano around when you're running. And that, that means you can't run. But not only Johnny, Johnny didn't carry it around, he stopped the play to something. <laughs> and if you can't do it, who's your next guy? Mike Schmidt. Greatest third baseman ever. Mike Schmidt, greatest third baseman ever. And, uh, <laughs> That's the cutest kid in the building. But do me a favor, son. Shut up. <laughs> Just kidding, buddy. He was like, gonna kick my ass. <laughs> Mike Schmidt was a, not only a home run hitter, but a great fielder. Uh, it's like this, okay? The greatest hitting third baseman ever. These are all my opinions, okay? The greatest hitting third pace in ever was a guy named George Brett. The best defensive catcher ever was a guy named Brooks Robinson. The best overall catch uh, third base in ever was Mike Schmidt, okay? The best overall catcher ever was Johnny Bench. The best offensive catcher ever was Mike Piazza. The best defensive catcher ever was Yvonne Rodriguez. That's the way you gotta put it. You know, there's not one that's the best in everything, okay? But George Brett could hit. Mike Piazza could hit. You know, they both, they both hit well over 300. Not many catchers hit over 300. Not many. And, you know, I, I played against some big catchers. I played against Yogi Berra. You know, uh, I played against some great players. Clemente, May, Aaron. And for you smart asses, I didn't play against Babe Ruth. <laughs> However, I believe that Babe Ruth is the greatest player in the history of baseball. And I'll tell you why. Because I don't think Michael Jordan could do what he did. I don't think Tom Brady could do what he did. And I, and I don't think Wayne Gretzky could do what he did. Babe Ruth, after 1919, when they had the Black Sox scandal, we go to this town or that town or this town and they sell out every game they play. So it enabled the baseball franchises to grow and mature and become good franchises. I don't think Michael Jordan can save basketball. He's the greatest, he's a goat. Brady's a goat. Gretzky's a goat. But I don't think they can save their sports like Babe Ruth did. And when I first came up, I used to sit next to our announcer whose name was Wade Hoyt. Some of the old timers you remember Wade Hoyt. And he's a Hall of Famer, and he played with Babe Ruth. So I know more Babe Ruth stories and Ty Cobb stories than anybody, because I'm a young, I'm a young 20 year old sitting on the plane, just talking to Wade, asking stories about the old timers. Because when I was a kid, that interested me. I wanted to know about those guys. And I would have loved to play with Babe Ruth. You know, uh, well, if I did, I sure in the hell wouldn't be here today. But <laughs> I, met, I remember several, several years ago when appreciated the way I played. And I'm going to tell you something. Talking to Babe Ruth's daughter, 
That's the most nervous I've ever been in my life. And I've been in front of federal judges before. <laughs> she, she just died a couple years ago. I'm saying to myself, that's Babe Ruth's daughter. She can't be Babe Ruth's daughter. I hope they say that about my kid. That's Babe Ruth's daughter? How can he have a daughter? I just never understood that. I was in awe and I met seven presidents. <laughs> seven presidents. You know, Christ is just another guy. Puts his pants on the same way I do. Just a couple of them had their pants off a lot. <laughs> Come on, Bill. Easy. <laughs> Are you scared over there? <laughs> bring it, bring it. I haven't cursed yet. I haven't cursed you. You haven't. I was at the turd and I said penis. That's all I was saying. I was at the All-Star game in, in a, or the World Series game in Atlanta when they bought the All-Century team on the field. Yeah. Seemed like what was a 10-minute standing ovation that night. You know, Hank Aaron played for the Braves. Did he Did he say anything to you he after right that? He's right next to me. He's right next to me. These people kept clapping. And he says, what's wrong with you? I said, what do you mean? He said, how do you get a bigger hand than I do in Atlanta? I said, just get suspended and stay away for 10 years. Eh? <laughs> I got it. It's true. I got it. If, if you want to know how long it was, for you guys that are married, when you get home from work, sun, Monday, go in the kitchen while your wife's cooking and clap for nine minutes. That's how long the ovation was when I got 4192. Now, that may not sound like a long time, but none of, none of you guys will be able to to, to stand up nine minutes and clap for your wife. I'm telling you, I'll bet you. <laughs> but that was the only time I've ever was on a baseball field uh, and didn't know what to do. See what happens in there. And, and I did it, so I know, what, I know how to explain it. <clears throat> the first five, six minutes are great. You know, the players come out, my sons come out. Marge brings the Chevrolet in. I told her I went to Porsche. Excuse me, damn Corvette. <laughs> and for five or six minutes, you know, you're enjoying it, the stand ovation and stuff like that. Then when you get to seven and a half, eight and a half, you start thinking about everybody that's not there that's responsible for you being there. In my case, my dad, my uncle, my little league coaches, my high school coaches, they were all gone. And that's what brings tears to your eyes. Okay, not that ovation, just your mind, what you're, what you're thinking about. And that's what happened to me at first base. I never, I didn't know what to do. That's the first time I was ever on a baseball field, and I didn't know what to do. So I just had to ride with the wave. But see, in that situation, ladies and gentlemen, you never know what's going to be the reaction of the, of the fans. Just like tonight. Hey, you gave me a standing ovation. I appreciate it. But I didn't expect it. Because you never know the pulse of the fans. Okay, good, bad, or indifferent. So when I put in Shea Stadium in the 73 playoffs, they're throwing, a guy threw a whiskey bottle at me from the third deck. Uh, yeah, it was empty. That New York fan, he drank it for his throat. <laughs> And one time I played in Chicago, and a guy in the bleachers in left field, I don't know, this guy's a dumbass because he threw a crutch at me. How do you throw a crutch at somebody? How the hell do you get home? <laughs> I played right field there. This is true. And a guy shot me right here with a paper clip. Okay? It bled for three innings. Okay? If I do like that, it would put my eye out. I only got 3,000 hits. <laughs> Just like Joey Gallo of, of the Yankees now. The guy struck out 213 times this past year. I told the newspaper guy the other day, I said, Jesus Christ. I said, Ray Charles won't strike out 213 times. <laughs> and Ray can't see the curveball. Or the fastball, or the side, or the screwball, or the knuckleball. I got, I got 64 hits off of Phil Negro from Atlanta. I got 44 hits off his brother Joe. Think about that. I got over 100 hits off the Negro family. 
I said, four of you, all my hits. If she'd have had five sons, I'd have got 5,000 hits. <laughs> Come on, Mrs. Negro. Give me some help. You running out of ammunition? All right. You get that in, I've got the picture. You standing on first, and uh, Steve Garvey's there, and he's laughing out loud, and he comes over and says something to you. What did Steve Garvey I say? I can't tell you. It's, 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 I get barred out of Tennessee. <laughs> you know, I tell you exactly. I got, I'm going to use one, one curse word tonight. This is Steve Garvey. If you see the picture, I'm standing on first base, and he comes up, and he's laughing his ass off. Okay, I look back at him. He looked at me and said, that's within eight minutes of ovation. He said, Pete, what the fuck did you do? <laughs> he didn't know I just broke the record, I guess. <laughs> but Steve, one time in, in his, with the Dodgers, this is true. I'm not lying about this. Steve had a, he had a hell of a summer one year with the Dodgers. He knocked up three girls in one summer. I told him, I said, Steve, I bet on your breeder's truck, you won the summer. <laughs> but he's a good guy. Plus his wife in the same year. How do you knock up four girls in one year? How do you get time? You're playing first base. It's like Groucho Mark said, he said, I like my cigar, but I take it out every once in a while. <laughs> that little blonde boy there is having more fun than any three people in this place. <laughs> All right, Jeff Lowe uh, has asked me to give a couple baseballs that you signed earlier out tonight. Do we have uh, Rob Norman? Is Rob Norman in the room? Stand up, Rob. Nice Jeff. Yeah. Nice Jeff. He didn't kill up. <laughs> we ain't giving him no damn balls. How about Troy Martin? <laughs> oh, no. Do we have Rob Norman or Troy Martin? He's my uncle. I should know where he is. <laughs> yeah. We got a couple baseballs for him there. We had a story to go along with those. But, uh, uh, is Barack Obama here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the Negro Brothers earlier. Uh, who's the toughest pitcher you ever faced? Uh, Sandy Koufax. I couldn't hit him. I couldn't hit him with that chair you got. <laughs> and no one could hit him. He was good. He had a great purple and a great fastball. Uh, I, just, I, I couldn't hit him. I hit 175 off of him. Mm. You know, like Gibson, I hit 307 off Gibson. I hit 340 off of Mary Jo. Uh, I hit 296 off of Nolan Ryan. And that's how I used to throw a ball through a car wash and not get it wet. I said, you know, guys throw so hard today. Pictures throw so hard. And the guy asked me here, and Dave said, well, what do you think you'd hit if you were playing today? I said, I don't know, I'd probably hit 240, 2, 242. He said, why, the pictures are that good? I said, no, I'm 80 goddamn years old. <laughs> Pete, the 90 Reds, the 90 Reds win the World Series, uh, a team that you had a lot to do with. In, in my opinion, you constructed that World Series team. Uh, tell us a little bit about that team and uh, some of the players on that ball club. Well, I finished second four years in a row, and they had four guys. And by the way, that team made me look good. You know, when the World Series is going on up down in Carbondale, Illinois, at USP Marion. That's a prison, by the way. I was in. No, telling them what's going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And they said, man, this guy knows baseball. I said, I had that team last year, brother. I know who's I know who's ticking, I know who's been sitting, I know who's been running. But they had four guys, guys I didn't have. They had Glenn Briggs, Hal Morris, Billy Hatcher, and uh, Randy Myers. If I'd had those four the years I finished second, I'd have won the pennant every year. They were just that much better. That was Lou Pinella's team. Uh, a lot of the players on that team were my players. 
You know, I brought Sable up. I brought Larkin up. I brought Paul Winneo up. I brought Browning up. Uh, I brought Milner up. I brought Greenus up. I had Eric Davis. So I had a lot of great players. As a matter of fact, in my five and a half years of managing the Reds, I saw 32 players get their first hit. That's a lot of players to get their first hit. But I believed in young players because young players give you enthusiasm. Okay, you need veteran players to be pinch hitters. Because it's hard for a young player uh, to be a good pinch hitter. Because you need patience and you gotta be aggressive. All young players are aggressive, but they're not patient. And that's, that's the way you manage your baseball team. Give them a chance to play. You know, you can't tell a player he's too, too good often enough. The more you the more you get on a player's uh, bound, bandwagon, uh, the better he's going to be. What are you going to know? Oh. He's back here. You're back here with your thing? We've got some good raffle things going on. Are we going to do some raffle tickets now? Let's draw what, some out. What's the, the, the one thing we're putting up for auction? Oh, yeah. We have a, uh, we have a dinner for four with Pete Rose. It's going to be in Las Vegas through the week at the Palm. Uh, Jeff, do you have a bid you want to start that out at? Jeff left with those other two guys. Dinner for four. Dinner for four with Pete Rose at the Palm in Las Vegas. Do I have a home and bid? Let's start that out at $4,000. We won't get mad if we bring five. Okay. <laughs> We got four thousand dollars in the back. Oh, four hundred. Four hundred dollars. We got four hundred. Was there a date? No, no date on it. Any it has to be through the week you in Vegas at the Palm. You decide the date. You I'm not gonna say a damn check for you. <laughs> I do this all the time and we get eight to ten thousand. Thousand dollars, got a thousand dollars right here. $1,000? I ain't going to dinner with anybody for people for $1,000. <laughs> dinner with the Hit King at the Palm in Las Vegas. Four people. You pick the four people. You get your plane tickets. Go to the Palm. You get to eat dinner with Picos. Hey, I'm not getting any of this. This is all going to what we're here for. Yeah, tonight, tonight all of this money is going to the baseball team tonight and Coach Douglas. This is helping them out. This is for a great cause. New coach. Trying to get the program up and going, and uh, all this will be for the CCHS baseball team. So right now we're at a thousand dollars. Dinner with Pete Rose. Looking for Jeff back there. I know he's going to go more than a thousand on this. Three you got three thousand. Jeff Lowe, three thousand. Dinner with Pete Rose, three thousand. Three thousand dollars. Anybody beat three thousand dollars? Anybody top three thousand dollars? Dinner with Pete Rose at the Palm in Vegas. You get it. Jersey too. You get an autographed jersey too. Autographed yeah. jersey, dinner for four. Four thousand. Got four thousand dollars in the back. Four thousand dollars. Four thousand dollars. Autographed jersey with Pete Rose, dinner for four at the palm. Baseball. You get a baseball. And a baseball. Autographed baseball, Pete Rose. Baseball jersey, dinner for four at the palm. You get to sit and talk to my girlfriend. Google that. Just Google that, okay? Four thousand. Got four thousand right now. Looking for five. Forty five hundred. You better hold it. You, you, you almost got there. You, you got your hand this far in that red right there. That was a good deed. Four thousand looking for forty five hundred. Got four thousand looking for forty five hundred. Dinner with a hit king. people you need to go to get the bid up? Do you need seven people? What? 4,500? 4,500 looking for 5,000. Got 4,500 in the back looking for 5,000. Shit, okay? Go for four to five, five to six, six to seven. That's seven right. To eight. Looking for five, looking for 5,000. We're at 4,500 looking for 5,000. 
45, got 5,000. 5,000 looking for six. There you go. 5,000 looking for six. We're at 5,000 now looking for 6,000. Dinner with a hickey, autographed jersey, baseball, and you get to meet his fiance. Is this sign? Fiance? Yes. <laughs> did, you, did you not hear what I said? I'm goddamn 80 years old. What happened to this side of the room? Is, is, it, is it the last speaker not on, on this side of the room? We're at five, looking for six. We're at 5,000, looking for six. 5,000, looking for six. Jeff, where are you? Once in a lifetime opportunity. Oh, 6,000. 6,000, looking for seven, right now. Bid in the back right. 6,000, looking for seven. Got 7,000. Uh, 7,000, looking for eight. We're at 7,000, looking for eight. 7,000, looking for eight. $7,000 right here, looking for $8,000. $7,000, looking for eight. $7,000, going once. Okay. Seven's okay. $7,000, going twice. So, $7,000, down with the HP. Leah, let's scrap something off here. Did that guy pick $7,000? You know what? Yes. Is he honest? Yes. <laughs> no, we're going to give the AR-15 first. AR-15. Winner of this gets an AR-15. Yes. What the hell do you want to give a gun away for? <laughs> it's not mine. Just... Tennessee. It's a thousand and sixteen. Stud drawing here for uh, 
Baseball, one card stud. Clubs. Ace of Clubs. Who has the Ace of Clubs right here in front? You got it? Which one was that for? That's for the women's package. For the women's package. The women's package. Now we doing the Yeti? Yeti Cooler. Doing a Yeti Cooler here. Seven of Clubs. 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 Yeah, baby. It was good for me because I got major league meal money. And meal money for a big leaguer is like two fifty a week. For a minor leaguer it's like a dollar fifty a week. And I got to go on a trip over to Clearwater to play the Yankees. I'm a non-roster player. There's 40 guys on the 40-man roster. And we're playing a game, and my day is done. I can go do my running, go take a shower, and get ready for the bus, which is a four-hour drive back to Tampa. And we had a coach named Mike Reba, who said, where are you going? you got to wait for the bus anyway. Stick around. You might get in the game. So all of a sudden, it's the ninth inning, and Hutch, my manager, he needed a pinch runner. And he put me in. Guy got a base hit to the 10 feet to the left of the left fielder. I went from first to third and did a hit first slide. In the third, I'm safe. Next guy popped up to the shortstop. It was Tony Kubek. And he's backpedaling. And nobody will throw my ass out backpedaling. Okay, it just doesn't happen. So I go in the hole head first. We win the game two to one. And Mickey Mantle and Whitey Ford were talking to the press. And the press asked about me and and Mickey said, did you see that Charlie Hustle beat us today? And the next day in the New York paper, Charlie Hustle beats Yanks. So I've been never named that. Who's going to win the series and how many games? What's that? Who's going to win the series and how many games? Who do I look like, God? <laughs> Well, I, I have a podcast every day. I'm going to tell you right now that I, I, picked, I picked Atlanta in a long series. And let, let me tell you why. Okay, It's just like when we swept the Yankees in 1976. It's the same way if you bet on a Super Bowl. Okay? And let's say the score is 56 to nothing. This is the fourth quarter. Okay, the only reason you're going to watch that game is you, you bet the over and it's 57. I don't like a sweep in the World Series. We're not going to have one here because it's already 2-1. But it's better for your sport if it's a long series. Because that's your showcase for your sport. We swept the Yankees in 76. And that was after we had the most exciting World Series ever in 1975 against the Boston Red Sox. And as a player, once you get playing in a, in a World Series, you don't want it to end. You wish you could play for 20 games. Because it's fun. You watched the ceremonies on the game last night and tonight. It's fun to be in a World Series. It really is. I mean, it's, it's a showcase for your sport. Super Bowl, NBA Finals, Stanley Cup Finals. Those are all showcases for their sports. And you don't want it to be boring. It's not good for your sport. This is going to be a good series because they're evenly matched. Okay, they're evenly matched. I don't know any of the damn pitchers that are pitching. But I watch two games a day, every day in Vegas. Hell, I watch two and bet on three. <laughs> I'm getting old with that shit, that Yeah, Braver. How did you get involved with the WWE and Vince McMahon? Uh, well, I did four of them. Four of uh, the wake all money. WrestleMania. WrestleMania. And how do I get involved? Vince paid 50000 every time I went. <laughs> I'll take 50000 for you to come and choke slam me right here. <laughs> and, and my action was always with Kane. He's from Tennessee. He's a, he's a mayor. No, he's the greatest guy. He's the greatest guy in the world. He tombstone me. They choke slam me. 
Uh, he threw me against the ring when I was a San Diego chicken. And if you notice that, that one, I was a San Diego chicken, but I didn't have the tail. Because Kane had a bad wrist, and he had to get his hand underneath my tail to lift me up to choke slam me. So when I, when I went down, I had to jump. That's what makes it look so high. Now, The Undertaker and The Big Show, I whipped their ass backstage. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you one thing. I have never in my life met a wrestler that was a nice guy. They understand it's just entertainment and they're the best. Just like the other night, you follow it? Oh yeah, I follow you know who, you know who Charlotte is? Yes, yeah. She's a ladies champion. Charlotte Flair, that's Rick's daughter. She got in an altercation the other night with another lady wrestler in the back. Vince had her removed from the stadium. He had her removed from the stadium. She's the woman's champ. I talked to Rick yesterday. He was pissed. <laughs> Rick's crazy. I didn't agree with him. I didn't agree with him. about two weeks ago with Hulk Hook. You know, Hulk, Hulk, Hulk kind of walked. He's worse than Johnny Bench. I saw Hulk. He's like this. Back to it. From all that time wrestling. He's a nice guy. How about this? I'm in the back room when he signed 1,400 autographs. 1,400. Okay? He got paid 250. 250,000. That's pretty good for 1,400 autographs, isn't it? I don't get near that. <laughs> but those guys are nice guys. This man's a nice guy. Stephanie's a nice guy. Triple H is a nice guy. You know, we, we went to a couple of other than the ones that I was uh, participating in. And by the way, that was a horseshit question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Best manager that you played against? Would it be like Tommy Lasorda or somebody like that, you think? Tommy Lasorda. Um, he was a good manager. Let me tell you something. People just don't understand this. Okay? You know what makes a good manager in baseball? One thing makes a good manager. You know what it is? Absolutely. Good players. You know any good managers had horseshit players? Doesn't happen. Sparky had the best players, Tommy Lasorda. He's coaching third one night in an all-star game. It's his first one. And he's a smart ass anyway. Okay? He's a fat Italian smart ass. <laughs> and, I, and I'm on first base and Wilder Hayes gets a hit the center. I go into third head first. And Tommy, it's his first first all-star game. He starts telling me the left fielder can't throw. The center fielder really charges. The right fielder's got a good arm. And I'm saying, Tommy, Tommy, shut up. He uh, just coached third. And I'm pulling his chain. He says, you know what? This is the third base and an all-star game. He said, we had a vote for the game. And you were voted the second best looking guy on the team. I said, who the hell was number one? He said, the other 24 tied for first. <laughs> what the hell, Tommy, you dango? <laughs> Tommy was sort of his, <laughs> on the road. He has never paid for a meal after the game. He's a freebie boy. But they feed him. They feed him. He, he, he was a good, he's a Hall of Famer. What can you say? He's a Hall of Fame manager. Not that many people make the Hall of Fame. I can't make it. I make the Hall of Shame. Yes, sir. After, after Sit down with that Yankee shit on <laughs> I just gave you props. He's the one that made me Charlie Hustle. After almost coming to fish the cuffs with Larry Boa, did you and him ever come back on speaking terms again? I wouldn't pick up Larry Bo. He's a little guy. That was Bud Harrelson. He turned, and that's 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 the Mets too. You don't know shit about New York. I wouldn't shove that little pepperhead. Yeah, buddy. Your age, son. Are you nine? 11, sir. 
Let him. You heard Sir Eaton? <laughs> that, that was the fastest way to get into the base, I thought. I didn't start doing it when I got to the big leagues. You know something, son? When I was your age, I played the game the same way as I played it when I was at Riverfront Stadium or Dodger Stadium or Yankee Stadium. Yeah. <laughs> We'd sweat your ass four in a row. But you got, but you got the ten World Championship. Yeah, I take my hat off to you. It's hard to do that. Yankees have won 27 World Championships. That's pretty hard to do. Next question. Come on, I'm getting ready to leave. You don't ask questions. Back there. You got it. Hat. Yep. In all your hip first slides, did you ever hurt yourself? No. No. How does that happen? Well, you think I'm lying? <laughs> the only way I would ever hurt myself is if I stowed my fingers. Because you land on your elbows and when I used to have scams on my elbows and my knees, that means I was doing good because I was doing a lot of head first slides. And you always, when you do head first slides, you always get your picture in the paper. Yeah. Um, you want the honest answer or do you want me to bullshit you? I don't, I, I'm over that. You know, I made the Reds Hall of Fame. I got a statue. I got my number retired. Uh, I know pretty much about a lot of guys in the Hall of Fame because uh, I come up 63. The first Hall of Fame player I played against was Sam Usual. So I, I know pretty much about all the Hall of Famers. And they think there's a bunch of altar boys up there. And I'm not accusing any of them doing anything. Do you really think that no one in the Hall of Fame took steroids? Do you really believe that? Are you that gullible? Are you, do you really believe I'm the only baseball player ever bet on a baseball game? But don't wait till I'm dead that they might consider it. But I got a son named Pete Rose, and he's got a son named Pete Rose. So they're going, to, they're going to get tired of Pete Rose. <laughs> and, and I guarantee you, when my son, my grandson has a kid, he'll name his kid Pete Rose. Do you have any regrets? Yeah, I shouldn't have been on baseball, you dumbass. Truth, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I've been on baseball. This is no lie. It cost me a hundred million. That's what it cost me. Because I've been managing the rest for 30 years, three million a year, four million a year, all the commercials off the field, hundred million it cost me. There's some people say, hey, I'm penalizing enough. What the hell do you want to do? Cut my balls off? <laughs> they ain't no good anymore anyway. <laughs> all you old bastards are laughing, huh? Right here, Cincinnati Reds jersey. What was your approach to hitting? Huh? What was your approach to hitting? Your approach to hitting. Oh, my approach to hitting? Uh, I tell youngsters this all the time. Hit the ball hard somewhere. I wish I was playing today. Well, no, I really don't. But when they put that shift on me, I ain't got 5,000 hits. I don't understand the shift. And I'm not one of these guys trying to hit the ball in the air. Because everybody wants to hit, hit home runs today. Because if you hit 30 to 35 home runs, they're going to pay you 15 or more million. It's all about this today. That's all it is. But God bless them. I hope they make millions of dollars. Okay? But, but don't stop playing hard because you're making money. Okay? Every time they, they pan in the dugouts, all the players look like their mom died yesterday. Hell, you're making 15 million. You're making 20 million. You're making 30 million. You're making, making 35 million. Hell, I can walk through hell in the gasoline suit for five million. <laughs> if I was playing today, I'd be making 35 million. And I wouldn't, sure the hell wouldn't be in Tennessee tonight. <laughs> uh, for Jeff, I would be, though. Yes.
Well, I appreciate that, young man. Let me tell you something about that. Let me tell you. And I tell people this all the time. People really pat me on the back for the way I play. And what I got to say about that is everybody that plays the game of baseball should play the way I played. Okay? Everybody who plays football should play the way I would approach it. Basketball the same way. Hey, man, you're out there for two and a half hours. You can't bust your chops. Because it's just like, it wouldn't be any fun for me to be here if it was 100 people. I'm happy we've got four or 500 people here. I'm used to sellouts. Okay? Because it, it makes you feel appreciated if you got a good crowd. I mean, it's, it's just the way I am, but most players aren't like me. You know, most players uh, wouldn't walk through hell like, like I did. I play hard every freaking day. Okay? I never got tired. I never lost weight during the season. Sure. I had bad years. Everybody has bad years. But I had a lot of good years, too. And I had a lot of, a lot of good teammates who played the same way I did. You don't have to play hard by running the first on a base on balls. That's just the way I was when I was the kid's age there. I saw Ian Slaughter do it on TV. And my dad said, wow, you see how he got down to first? That's nice. You ought to do it. I started doing it. I, I was so lucky because uh, I had a father who was an athlete. And he's probably the best football player to come out of Cincinnati. And I was a water boy. I was a bat boy on the softball team. I was a ball boy on the basketball team. So don't forget, I grew up in the 40s and the 50s. So every, every time my dad went somewhere, I'm in the car going with him. And my dad always corrected me when I was in the Little League on the way home if I made a mistake. I think in my Little League career, I made two mistakes. <laughs> but he would always correct me on the way home. He didn't, not one of these dads, said, please dads, if you got grandkids, you got kids, don't yell at them when they make a mistake in front of their peers. Because you're going to lose them. They're not going to want to play. No kid wants to play when his dad's screaming from the sidelines. And I've seen it a lot in the Little League games. You feel like drilling that guy. Let the kid play. Let him play. Yes, sir. Who was the first position you played when you came back? Yeah, we're back in that position shit again. <laughs> um, when I was in high school, uh, well, when I was in Little League, up until my sophomore year of high school, I was a catcher. You know, I went to second base, and I played second base two years and two months in the minors, and I played second base for the Reds in 63, 64, 65, then I went to left field, then I went to right field, then I went to center field, then I went to third base, then when I went to Philadelphia, I went to first base. I want you to know I had your rookie card. When they traded, they moved you to left field. I took an eight year and parked that. <laughs> and wrote down left field. You're a dumb guy, too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I wish I had played some baseball cards. I mean, uh, I, had a, I had a baseball card in my hand about two weeks ago. I was in Chicago. This guy's, he's almost a, bit, a bigger collector than Jeff is. And this guy put uh, a Jackie Robinson rookie card in my hand. It was a 10. It was worth $4.2 million. A baseball card. And he was offered $4.7 million. I don't understand cards and ratings and stuff like that. Uh, but those guys do, boy. There's some guys that are head over heels in that business. Sounds like he's a bigger dumbass than me. <laughs> well, you got 4.2 million, the guy will offer you 4.7. You're making 500 grand. He's done that double. That's 250,000 uh, daily double, buddy. <laughs> what your girls want back there? Hello? Earth. Earth and Mars, come in for Earth and Mars. You still remember the other belt? Huh? How much money did you make? For tonight? <laughs> you can stack it up and a show doll can jump over it. Uh, the most I ever made in a year, two million. You know, 
know that that was uh, 19, 1986. You know, I mean, you got to get paid. I mean, it's, uh, I had a job for 24 years. It wasn't really a job for me. And, and by the way, there is something about an aqua. <laughs> I did that. I did, I did that one time with Betty Buckley. Remember her? Yeah. Mother on Eight Is Enough. Yeah. Remember Enola Hutton on Hee Haw? And I start going downhill, and I did one with Joe Mormon. <laughs> How we doing, Jeff? Right here. Do you still keep in touch with a lot of your your teammates? I see him. Well, we just lost one of my best friends, Joe. Joe Mormon, uh, most intelligent player I ever played. Really smart. Really, he was good. I mean, five foot six, MVP back, back to back years. He, he, he just knew how to play the game. You know, he, he, he was, a, he was a good, good one. I still talk to Perez. I've been knowing him sixty. You know anybody sixty one years? You know why? Because you're not sixty one. <laughs> I mean, imagine knowing that guy for sixty one years. We were kids together in Geneva, New York. It's even better if you could understand him, though, right? <laughs> I got a story about to tell me this is honorary, but it's, it's truth and it's funny. Okay? <laughs> Joe Nuxell used to do the star of the game show right next to the dugout. And he would leave the radio booth after the eighth inning and come down to get set up for the, all for the star of the game show. And we're playing at home. And Tony hits a home run in the ninth inning. <clears throat> And he goes around and paces right to the star of the game show, which is right next to the dugout. And Joe said, Tony, he says, you hit a home run at night? You win the game? What did you hit? Tony said, Joe, he said, I hit a cock high fastball. <laughs> <laughs> Joe said, no shit. <laughs> Joe was the best. Joe was the best. He, he, he'd say, oh my God. The guy who won the left, left, right, center field. Where the hell's that at? Left, right, center field. Is there any right, center, or left, center? Not left, right, center field. And he said, one time he said, hey, we're doing a game in LA. He said, for those of you back east scoring in bed, that one six to four to three. Double play. Nobody scored back east. <laughs> Next, yes, sir. What do you think about the movie Moneyball and that whole philosophy of? Uh, I'm not a big Moneyball a supporter because I'll tell you why. Because they didn't win. Now, if you're a manager of the Oakland A's and you develop some really good players and they want to trade them to save dollars and you're coming in third or fourth place, how's that helping you? You're in, you're in a game of baseball, one, to win, and two, to make money. If, you know, normally, if you win, you'll make money. It's just the way it is. Moneyball. Sure, you saved the owner money. You saved the owner a lot of money. But you didn't win games. I, I don't believe in that. We've got time for uh, 33 more questions. <laughs> one more question. We're going to let Dr. Vaughn wrap this thing up. One more question. <laughs> Pitcher you least likely wanted to face, Steve Carlton or James Rodney Richard? Uh, probably James uh, Jr. Yeah. Because he was six foot nine, threw his fastball ninety nine, threw his slider ninety two, and didn't like white guys. <laughs> the other guy was pretty good too. I really can't tell who the best pitcher I ever had or ever played, uh, played against. Because as soon as you say Seaver, you think about Carlton. As soon as you say Carlton, you think about Gibson. As soon as you say Gibson, you think about uh, Marichal. Then, then you think about Koufax. Then you think about Drysdale. Then you think about Negro. Then you think about Sutton. Then you think about Fergie. All Hall of Fame. I faced 19 Hall of Famers. 19. We used to have a road trip. We'd get through with a game on Sunday in Cincinnati. 
And we go to LA and we face Colfax Drysdale and Sutton. Then we go to San Francisco and face Gaylord, uh, Gaylord and Marischal and somebody else. Then we stop in St. Louis on the way home and face Carlton and Gibson and somebody else. So that's a nine game uh, series, seven Hall of Famers. That's a rough ass road trip. But you had to do it because that's, that's the schedule. You know, you, I like to pick who I could hit. It would be the Cubs in, in, in Atlanta. That was my two best, uh, highest averages. I mean, when I played against the Cubs, you could hit 320 against the Cubs. <laughs> I remember before they won the World Series three, three or four years ago, I used to say, you know what God told the Chicago Cubs? Don't do nothing until I get back. <laughs> and they listen. Really, I, I really enjoy myself. I hope I didn't offend anybody. Have a great night. Be careful. Go ahead.